Hey, I'm Anfa. In this video, I'm going to show you the character controller in Liblast and explain how it works. So the character controller is what allows you to move around the level, jump, jetpack, and, you know, all kinds of stuff. All right, so here is the character scene. This is where all of the character components are coming together. Here we have the physical collider. Here we have the head, the model, the various effects, uh, also sound emitters and stuff, but let's collapse this all down. Okay, so this is the character. A character is a um, is uh, a character body 3D or the character extends a character body 3D which means that it has all the movement options of a character body 3D and these are all visible here in the inspector in this tab. So the Godot's character body 3D controller, or like rather a character body, <laughs> a 3D character body node supports uh, walking or floating. You can pick what is the direction uh, that you want to consider up, which by default is up. <laughs> Uh, there's settings regarding mm, how you interact with sloped floors, moving platforms, and collision. Characters collide, or rather, characters appear in collision on layers 4 and 11. Mm, this is so that, first, everything that checks for players only will detect collisions with characters, and the dead bodies can be pushed around by characters, or rather by um, active characters. If that wouldn't be true, uh, then char dead characters would just, you know, you would just face through them. Okay. Mm. Du -du 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 right. Okay, so now, um, the movement of the character, or rather, the, the controller is actually a scene that is spawned inside of the character. So what I've done in Liblast is abstracted many things so that a character controller is a separate scene. This is a character controller class, which just has a character controller script. And this is a framework. This script is not a character controller that does stuff. It's just a framework where you can build your own character controller. For example, a character controller bot is extending the character controller class. And it's implementing a bunch of stuff that controls the characters using artificial intelligence, which use the navigation, have some sensors and stuff. Uh, there's also the character controller player, which is what we most need and want. And now, why are these scenes and not just scripts? That's because be having the character controller be a scene that I can instantiate inside of the character this means that a character controller can come with its own nodes, like raycasts and colliders and navigation agents and stuff, and it doesn't have to spawn these things from code, which makes it much more, much easier to develop, especially if you like, you make a, like a character which, you know, needs a bunch of raycasts in different places. Um, controlling all of this, setting all of this from code would be very tedious and error-prone. 
having it be a scene is much easier. Okay, so here we have the character controller player. This is the kind of controller that takes inputs from keyboard and mouse and interprets them and passes them through to the character. So the character movement is done through multiple things. There's the control controller, which is what provides the inputs, and it's we choose it here, and there is character movement. Character movement is a component that interprets the inputs and actually affects the character body, and that is just a script, but it is spawned um, it is instantiated as a as a node in runtime. So when the character is created, um, one of the things that happen is that we create uh, create our controller. So first we check if there is a controller scene already present or already selected. If it is selected, so something is provided in here, we instantiate it, we wire it up to have access to the character. So the controller needs to know who is it controlling. It needs to, we need to, uh, it needs to like receive controller events that the character is receiving. Mm. Or rather, or rather, we need to receive controller events that it's sending. Um, this is called to initialize the controller, blah blah blah. And then we are we are adding the character controller scene as a child of the head. So the character controller scene is spawned in here. So if it's a bot, then, you know, all the sensors, all the sensors end up and stay sheeted in this place. Wait, something's not right. Yeah. And uh, let me reset that. Yeah. So now you see how the character controller bot is set up so that the sensors are in different places. For example, this raycast here checks if you can walk, jump over something. This checks if you're walking into a wall. This checks if you're standing in front of a ledge. This one checks if you're, if you have ground beneath your feet, if you're touching a wall left, right, etc. And there's a shape cast that checks if you're aiming at an enemy. So the game does this for you. So the game instantiates this scene here and puts it here at runtime. This is done so we can easily change what controller a character receives because I can instantiate a character scene and just change what is provided here and the character will be spawned with a different controller scene parented to its head. It can also be instantiated without any controller which means it's just gonna stand around and do nothing. But it's still a character, it's just a brainless one. So the character controller is the brain. And we can choose what brain we want to give our character here. So here the brain is inserted into the head. And we also make sure that the, <laughs> it's placed inside the head and not outside for some reason. This is probably superfish, like superfluous, but maybe not. Mm. Now, there's also something called movement. Movement is... Uh, yeah, movement is probably going to be instantiated in here. Yes, so. We also have movement. Movement is a component that processes the inputs from controller, which is the brain, and turns these inputs into actual physical movement of the character body. So this is like motor skills uh, of our character. And because there's just one type of it, right now it's not possible to just attach a different movement component to your character. But 
it would be possible to do the same thing as it as it's done with the controllers, which means you can swap out the movement logic or component and you know, for example, some character may want to have a jetpack. Uh, another one might one might maybe wants to have a different controller that supports double jumping or dashing or whatever, teleporting. And we can just swap these out. That's an option in the future. Right now we just have one character movement component. So that character movement component is spawned and it is, uh, let's see where it is. So it is instantiated when the character scene is instantiated and then the mm, uh, then we wire up the movement mm, to be able to send us HUD updates. Character HUD update is something that contains information what should be shown on your heads of display. Stuff like um, you're losing health or you got hit from there or you hit a, an enemy. So our movement can like our movement can affect stuff um, like, you know, for example, fall damage is inflicted by the movement component. So it needs to be able to tell you, hey, you've fallen and you've hurt yourself. So this is where the movement um, component is wired here. Here's the controller. We also tell the movement con component what character is it controlling. We could, in the movement component, just, you know, check our parent. But you see, this would mean that we are assuming something from within the movement component about the structure above it, because we may want to instantiate the movement con character, the movement component somewhere. Maybe it's a node, maybe it's not. Actually, it's not even added to the scene tree. Um, it's just floating in in memory because it doesn't need to. It, it it doesn't need a physical reference in the free space. The character is its free physical reference. So this is like the movement soul of the character. It's it's ethereal. <laughs> uh, this is the physical brain here, the controller scene, and this is the ethereal movement soul. <laughs> Maybe this is the soul. All right. Now, what happens in the uh, character movement? Character movement uses the signal character HUD update to send updates. It knows what character it controls. And basically, this, this component is being called every physics frame, and actually every frame as well, to uh, like process physics of our character. So in the character, if we go to process function, you can see that the character is uh, like calling various things that need to be processed. I don't think it calls movement here. No. Ah, oh, right. Okay. In physics process, it's going to call movement. There it is. Physics process. So this is the physics process callback of the character. And in it, it is calling the process method of movement component. And it is passing the delta uh, parameter. The delta is the time that it that has passed since the last frame. So this tells it how much time has passed since the last time we called it. So it's used to determine how much movement we need to like do and stuff. So the movement process method is called. Let's go to that, to that method. Here's the movement process method. First thing is we are checking if our character is queued for deletion. And if it is, then we just skip it, everything. Now we're checking if the character is maybe dead. If the character is dead, then we're checking if the jetpack is true. And this is basically uh, applying jetpack thrust to a physical bone and the character. This is making the characters um, use the jetpack when they are ragdolled. Mm. Yeah. Uh. 
Mm. So this is also what, what happens if the character, uh, like, because the ragdoll is like a separate thing. It, it's not really the the physical character. It's not a character body. Uh, the ragdoll is completely independent. Mm. Now, we check if this is, uh, if we are, if there is a multiplayer, like, a game going on, or rather if there is a game going on at all. Mm. Because we are either a host or a client. Now we apply the character. Yeah, what this does is this is for networking. This means that because we are, we have a custom defined movement velocity variable, which is uh, synchronized using a multiplayer synchronizer. Here it is, movement velocity. This is no, it's not. It's not synchronized. Interesting. <laughs> Maybe I'm synchronizing it manually then. I don't know. Yeah, interesting. Maybe, ah, oh, I think I'm synchronizing this on a different level. This might be leftover craft. Anyway, this method is calling character move and slide. So movement component is what calls characters move and slide method. <laughs> so we were processing the movement. Yeah. So this is if the character. This is related to networking. Maybe I'm going to skip this. Um, this is done so that character authority, network character authority, is going to set the character velocity, and it's going to affect it. And the other, uh, the other uh, peers. So. For example, if I control my character, then I am its authority. And everyone else also has a copy, like has an instance of a character, but it's not an authority on their end. Their end is a puppet. <laughs> it's following uh, the authority, which is the instance of the character that is on my computer. So this is done to make the remote characters, character like instances sync to the to the one that is controlling the movement. Uh, if we're dead, then, well, there's no point in processing other stuff because other stuff is uh, done with stuff like inputs, I believe. Right, so this is gravity. If we're on the floor, we don't affect gravity. If not, then we are applying gravitational uh, acceleration. Here is um, our air control. So medium is what kind of matter we're moving through. Be usually it's on the ground, so we're moving on the ground, or we can be in the air. There could be other things like water, so, you know, floating underwater. And this is then used to fetch values for acceleration and deceleration. So here we're just telling, okay, if we are touching the ground, that means we're on the ground, we're grounded. And this is then later used. Now, if the character is alive, actually this is kind of superfluous because here we're just skipping everything and here we are asking if it's alive. So this is kind of unnecessary. You can see that this code could use some refactoring, but I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to explain how it works or overview more or less. Right, so here is the jumping uh, control. If the character control of type jump has recently changed or changed this frame, this update, and we are on the floor, and also the control is pressed and not released, so that because this means it was changed, that means it, it's changed when it's pressed and it's released. But if it's pressed, so this all means that the code here is going to trigger only at the instant you press the, the jump key. If you hold it down, it's not going to trigger because this only happens when you press or release a key. So, um, yeah. 
And this is all using our control system. So this is stuff passed through the controller. The character like is keeping, basically the character is keeping um, tabs on what controls are enabled or disabled, like, you know, left, right, up, down, movement, space bar, trigger, uh, etc. These are all controls. And then the character's brain tells it what controls to enable and disable. And these, this, the brain can be telling that based on the character, the keyboard and mouse you're 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 using, or it can be doing that based on the AI logic that is in the bot controller. The character doesn't care, but it keeps track of all the controls it has and processes the physics and everything else based on that state. So this character the controls holds uh, a dictionary of different controls and it's their state right so this call this is um this is um run once when you hit the the jump key and you are on the ground and you are alive and this increases the gravity vector by the jump velocity it also makes the character say, uh, make a sound, a jumping sound. Mm. There is also a timer. This is done so that when you jump off the ground and you keep holding jump, there's a small, a small pause that will happen when the jetpack isn't activated, but if you keep holding the jump key, after the small pause, the jetpack will be activated automatically. So that you don't have to double tap the jump key to jump and then use the jetpack. You just press it and hold it down and it's going to automatically be enabled after a short delay. This is so that the delay is there so that you can tap the jump key and jump without deploying the jetpack whatsoever, which is important because that gives you a reproducible jump height but the convenience of controlling the jetpack with the same key as jump is also very important. And this was implemented most recently, like this is the most recent change. Here, if the character is not on the floor and the jump is enabled, then we immediately skip this timer. So that means you can double tap jump key to enable the jetpack sooner. <laughs> so this means you can override the, this timer if you just double tap your jump key. Uh, <laughs> and then jetpack run dry, clear the flag. Uh, I don't remember what this is, but I guess it's something to do with running dry. Okay. Next thing is we are measuring the time that we're jumping. So if we're jumping, then we, in, we decrease the time of the jumper. The thing is jump jetpack threshold is a number of seconds. I think it's like 0.2 or something. And then we decrease it by the time since the last frame. This means that when jump time reaches zero, this timer has run out. Right now, and this is used to turn on the jetpack automatically. Now the jetpack control, if the jetpack fuel is more than jetpack minimum fuel and the move jump control is enabled and the jetpack isn't running dry <laughs> and the jetpack was started from the ground and the jump time is less than zero. So this means that we can only enable the jetpack if we are holding the jump, um, if we're holding the jump key and the timer run out, or we're not starting from the ground and then we don't need, we don't care about the timer. Then <laughs> we activate the jetpack. This is a huge logic statement. Um, it could probably be broken down into multiple if statements, but uh, maybe it's clearer this way. I don't know. It's very complicated. If you have an idea of how to refactor this and make it clearer, uh, go ahead. Um, get in touch. Right. So we're enabling the jetpack. Now, if we're, if the jetpack control is disabled, so basically we just release the jump key, 
then we deactivate the jetpack. Okay, now, if the character jetpack is active and the fuel is above zero, now this is running the jetpack. So discharging the jetpack. Uh, and this only works if we are alive. But the other parts work still if we are dead, which is important because this stuff that still happens. Or does it? Does it happen? No, it, no, it's not. Okay, this is still superfluous logic. So we could just cut this out. But I'm gonna leave it. <laughs> If we are alive, we are affecting the gravity vector by the jetpack. And this is incrementing to the up direction, the jetpack thrust. And then we use the minimum of delta and jetpack fuel. Delta is means that we are applying just as much thrust as much time has passed since the last frame. This ensures the acceleration is constant and doesn't depend on the frame rate. However, it might happen so that we deplete our fuel mid-frame. So this ensures that we are not going to have, like if this, if we just they multiply it by delta and not by jetpack fuel and delta minimum, that would mean we could basically have a randomly more or less fuel based on the frame that we started or ended the jetpack. And this means we can only get as much acceleration as our fuel allows. And we, if we deplete our fuel, then we're not going to get the full frame worths of acceleration, only as much as the, the fuel allows. Now we're draining the fuel, so we are taking like this, this amount, and we're taking the maximum of jetpack fuel, negative delta, or zero. And this, because it is possible that the jetpack fuel is going to be zero and then negative delta is going to be a negative number and the maximum means that we're always giving this a positive number. The, the jetpack fuel can never be negative, basically. Character, camera shake, jetpack shake amount. Yeah, this makes it so that a character can apply a camera shake that is specific for jetpack use. It's a it's a vertical high frequency vibration. You can see it on the gun model when you're jetpacking. There's special amount. Uh, yeah, this is for displaying the the jetpack fuel bar in the in the game on the heads up display, and this is calculated by how much fuel we have versus how much fuel we can hold. Now we're preparing a heads up display update. Uh, we're creating a new update and filling up the amount. Special type is an enum, I believe, and it's just a jetpack for now. We don't have any other special movement abilities defined yet. And update special is true, which means that the special is deployed, I think. Now that we're using this update. Yeah, and now we are emitting the update. Uh, this makes it so that the character movement co component emits a signal that the character is listening on. You see here, here we are in character's ready method or callback. Maybe it's callback, I don't know. Function, let's call it function. In the character ready function, we are connecting the signal from the character's movement component to a method that is called this. And if I search for that method, actually I can search for it here. This method digests the update. It just says, okay, this update is related to me. And also my character state is this. And we're emitting this upwards. And what is this? This is then received by heads up display. HUD listens onto this signal from character, it, it intercepts that and it displays it on the screen, if need be. This is following this uh, philosophy of um, calling down and signaling up, because the character 
should not have to know about heads up display at all. Like it just needs to make the information available. And if the heads up display is there, it's going to, it, it, it's a responsibility to tap into this signal and intercept this information and process it. The character itself doesn't care about it. <laughs> Similarly, the movement component doesn't care about the, okay, the movement component is a little bit different because it is acting directly on the character, but it has the reference to the character past. So the character, when it's creating the movement controller, or the movement component, it is instantiating it and it is giving itself as a reference so that the character movement has a reference to the character so it can directly act upon it. We are not, we don't need to like make any assumptions that the character is there. It's like our direct parent or per, like parent of the parent of the parent because we are like child of the camera and head and character and you know we don't make these assumptions we just expose a variable this is going to be the character if it is if it exists we do stuff with it if it doesn't exist we we don't so now it's character's responsibility to set this variable properly so that the character movement component can call methods and you know read and write um parameters properties right Let's get back to process. Turning Jetpack on and off, discharging, running empty. So now if Jetpack fuel happens to be empty and it is going to be exactly zero because we are using this max here. So it's if it's going to negative, it's gonna be zero. So we can use this equation here. We don't have to do, you know, less than 0.0, .0 or less equal zero no we can just do equals zero because it's going to be precisely zero unless floating point logic is going to mess this, uh, mess with us and then we should use something like is approximately <clears throat> is zero approximately on the jetpack fuel which is an option to do which might be faster to do and less error prone, but I never had problems with this, so I'm not gonna stick with the what is like what is here already. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is kind of failing because I'm not used to talking that much. I haven't been recording videos lately. Uh, hopefully, I'll get through that. Right. So if the jetpack fuel is empty, is all out, we are deactivating the jetpack. We are disabling the camera shaking, and we also turn the, the flag that says that we are running dry. This means that the jetpack is enabled, but it has run out of fuel. And this has some special, um, special meaning. Oh no, my cat is on my keyboard. No, okay. Please don't step on my keyboard. Thank you, sweetheart. Right, now, if the jetpack is not being used, it's going to be recharging. So if the jetpack is not active and the fuel isn't overflowing the tank, then we make the jetpack fuel increased by the recharge rate and times delta, and we ensure that we are not putting more fuel than the jetpack tank can hold. So jetpack tank is a variable that says how much fuel can we have, and jetpack fuel is means how much fuel do we have in our tank? I hope the names are not misleading or confusing rather. Right, now there is another uh, hard update to be made if we are re recharging jetpack and that is above, about the change of, uh, you know, the fuel amount. So again, we're making um, an update telling about the fuel and we're emitting it up. And uh, okay, also, if we are recharging, we are ensuring that there is no jetpack shake, camera shake applied. Uh, so there could be something else, like you know, a sound effect or, or something that lets us know that we're charging jetpack. It could be useful so you can, like, know if you're like finished recharging jetpack, if you have full jetpack bef without looking at your HUD. I don't know, this is something 
possibly to be improved upon. Right, next up is walking logic. First we have walking direction. We initialize a variable that is already created um, and it is interpolated but like during the movement. Now we're taking the controls of the character. We have moving forward, moving backward, moving left and moving right. This is strafing, of course, and this is walking for forward and back. Um, so basically W, A, W, S, A and D keys. But remember that this is abstracted because the AI controllers can press these keys or press in air quotes. They're not pressing anything. They're just, you know, marking these controls as enabled or disabled. So each of these uh, controls adds up onto the walking direction. And this is quite an elegant solution because this means that if you hold up to hold down two keys like forward and backward at the same time they cancel each other out because we're subtracting and we're adding now what is the character transform basis z <laughs> this is the local characters forward direction negative z axis is the forward direction it's like how how it's defined in the engine. Negative Z is forward. <laughs> so I'm taking basis, which is um, like the... This defines rotation of the, of the character. Like this means that walking direction is actually a, a vector in world space. And we are making it so it is... Um, pointing towards the character's rotation in the world space. This is important because we are going to be interpolating to this and uh, this, we're doing this in world space, not in local space, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do proper interpolation, basically air control and like um, how your character is you know, slowing down and speeding up, how does it what happens when you like walk forward and you press backwards how you slow down and start speeding up backwards what happens if you if you like turn your head 90 degrees etc this is important uh and it's it's done this way so that um this momentum in when, when changing your direction and air control and stuff everything works well now if we are dead okay so this isn't superfluous Actually, kind of is, because we're skipping this. Why is we doing this? We're cutting off some logic. Like, this is never going to be triggered. If we're dead, then Jetpack is dis disactivated and we're n walking towards nowhere. Makes sense. Yeah, so this is pretty much just superfluous. This could be cut down. But I'm not going to touch this uh, code. I'm going to explain it. Now, we normalize the length of the vector. This is just in case, uh, just in case that somehow the length of this is not one, which is the unit vector. Uh, it should be because every one of these axes is a unit vector. So it should add up to a unit vector. Actually, no. If we like press forward and right, then we add two unit vectors and the length of the walk direction would be greater than one. This is why old games like Quake, they that don't do this correction. It, you move faster if you move diagonally. <laughs> if I'm correct, I think. In some old games, it's true. You walk faster when you walk diagonally because they don't do this. <laughs> They don't normalize the walk direction vector, basically. Uh, if I'm mistaken, let me know in the comments. Now, we change this, translate this um, direction into, or rather, we, we sample our um, speeds, acceleration, and damping based on the medium that we are moving on. So you might remember we set the medium to air or ground. 
So now here, I'm going to set a bookmark here. Control Shift B, Control Alt B, yeah, Control Alt B. Right, I'm going to move up, uh, scroll up, and you can see here we have medium. So enum, medium is air, ground, or water. This is not used yet. Then we have variable medium. By default, it's ground. And then we have different parameters of movement, acceleration, speed, and damping. And there are values in this dictionary defined for every type of medium that we can move from. So for ground, acceleration is 12. For air, it's just one. Uh, speed for ground is 10, for air it's 10 as well. For water it's going to be lower, for example. Maximum speed of movement. Damping for ground it's zero, so you don't slow down. But for air, there is damping, so you do slow down in air. And stuff like that. So now we're going to go back to our bookmark. Control alt b Right, so we've sampled these values. Now these are going to be used in calculating our velocity. Right, and our movement velocity is interpolated from previous frame's movement velocity, and we are interpolating by the walk acceleration times delta. This means that the interpolation is different based on the medium. This is basically air control. So when we're on the ground, we have higher acceleration. So the lerp is going to faster, update faster. Like we're going to change our direction quicker when on ground because air air acceleration is lower. Then the lerp is not going to interpolate so quickly. So changing our direction in air is going to be slower. And then what we do is we multiply the walk direction times speed based on the medium again. And this is the target. We are, ex we are interpolating towards this target using this. I'm not using spherical interpolation or slurp. I'm just That's beautiful, slurp. Uh, because this is not an angle. But you should... You should interpolate uh, spherically angles. <laughs> this is not an angle. All right, so this is our acceleration, deceleration, movement velocity. If we are on the floor, uh, compensate for ground friction. We're dividing the push velocity by 60 if we are not on the floor. If we are now we're going movement velocity plus time equals push velocity. Push velocity is zero. Okay, I don't know what push velocity is. Oh, wait, okay. Push velocity is what... Um, it's impulses that you, you receive from the world. So if you... If someone shoots you, they give you push velocity. Now this code is messed up because there is a problem. If when, you are on a, when you're on the ground, Pushing is pretty much ineffective. So if you like something explodes near you, you're not pushed at all when you're on the ground, unless we have this. But this creates the problem that uh, if you're standing on the ground, someone shoots you and you like fly off the edge or, or fly into the sky. <laughs> so this creates some weird effects. Um, yeah. <laughs> And this is applied, just the push velocity is applied just once. So it's like an impulse. It's zeroed after it's used, okay? Right, now, previous velocity is the character velocity. The velocity is the property of the, of the physical body. The movement velocity is a variable that we defined in character, or rather in movement. A component for the character, but the velocity, this is the property that we need to set in order to process, move, and slide. Uh, now, we are also remembering if we have been on the floor in the previous frame. So this is where we store the information. Now, we change the velocity 
using movement velocity plus gravity, and we're interpolating this towards nothing at the rate of damping times delta. So this, this is drag or damping. This is air drag right here. And this is just walking plus gravity. And because gravity is affected by jumping and jetpacking, this is also jumping and jetpacking. If the velocity length is higher than top velocity, actually there is just a one-liner. <laughs> it's like limit length. <laughs> Again, not going to touch the code now, but this, this can be simplified to a very short one thing. And finally, we perform the movement. So we tell Godot, okay, process the physics of the character based on this velocity. Mm, right. We're, go we're, we're nearing the end of the movement code. If the character blah, blah, blah. Okay, preserve momentum after collision while in air. Mm, there was a problem at some times where... I think if you hit a wall while flying, you would like not change your direction. Yeah, basically we need to feed back the character velocity after character movement slide is called to our movement velocity, which is the base basis that we are like working on. Because otherwise the movement slide cannot affect our velocity. And that's a problem. Because without this, what this should, the comment should more say like, um, I don't know, uh, allow move and slide to affect velocity. Because this, this makes it so that we change our walking direction based on move and slide. So if we move across a wall, um, we slide across it and we are like, we jump and we hit ourselves on the head. We're also, you know, we're going to change our velocity. And this is applied here. Without this, you jump in a in a short tunnel, and you're you just stick to the to the ceiling until your your velocity drops. With this, you you just hit your head on the ceiling and stop right there and fall down. So yeah. Finally, we are um, running sound effects, which is like less important stuff. This is you know not movement; it's cosmetics. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this is just, you know... Oh, fall damage, that's important. <laughs> if the character is on floor and wasn't previously, so this is... If if this is the frame that we just hit the, f the ground, we, we check the velocity that we had before versus the velocity we have now, which gives us uh, the velocity loss. So basically, how hard did we hit the ground? And we com we com we compute a loudness for the sound that plays when we hit the ground, and then we also use that to com to compute damage that we receive from falling. And we apply the hurting, and this is for multiplayer. Uh, finally, only process weapon bob for currently viewed first person character. Yeah, so this is processing weapon bob. And you can see Weapon Bob and Weapon Sway are two separate methods in movement. I think Sway is disabled. Yes, Weapon Sway is disabled by default because it's broken. Weapon Bob is your weapon moving up and down as you walk. Weapon Sway is your weapon moving left, right, up and down as you change your aim or like turn your head. And this is broken, so yeah. Right, and these methods do their thing. Okay, I think that's enough for one video. Because we're 50 minutes in. Character movement. This, so if you want to contribute to movement, you, you're going to work in code with this script. And you're going to work with this scene. If you want to, you know, affect the physics, add some colliders, collision shapes, like this is the body collision shape. But there's also, you know, particle attractors. 
uh, and collision sphere, stuff like that. There's also the character controller, but I don't want to get too deep into that. Basically, this captures your keystrokes and mouse movement and generates character controller events. I think every character controller event can have a number of character control changes. Each character control change contains a name, like the, the type of the control and information if was it is it just changed or is it enabled now or is it disabled or stuff like that. And the character also keeps track of that. So in the character script, uh, there it is, character controls. So these can be turned on and off. The problem is Liblast's code isn't really made to work with analog controllers. So if we wanted to implement, you know, a gamepad control for walking, this would not work because the movement controls are binary. You either walk forward or you don't. So uh, if we wanted to implement this kind of stuff and allow, you know, analog movement control, then we would have to rework this and do something else. Oh yeah, this keeps keeps the memory of what is what keys are pressed, basically. <laughs> okay, I hope this was interesting, maybe hopefully useful in some way. Hopefully, uh, if you'd like to contribute to Liblast, this video was of some help to get you acquainted with the character movement code, how this is organized, what is the real the framework that is like it all happens in. Yeah, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.